Hello, and welcome back to Knowledge on the Go, Wit and Wisdom Virtual Lessons. My name is Mrs. Lopez, and I'll be one of your teachers for this virtual lesson experience. Let's get started. Be ready to think, share your ideas, look forward to learning, and try to stay focused. In the last lesson, we met the characters of Raymond's Run and analyzed Squeaky's traits by looking at her words and actions. Today, I'm excited to continue with learning with part two of lesson two, grade five, module four, Breaking Barriers. In this lesson, you will need a pencil, your journal, handout 2B, Raymond's Run, and handout 2C, Fluence, which, Fluency, which is optional. Pause the video now if you need to get any materials or need a minute to get organized for learning. Just as a reminder, here is how you get your student downloads for your handout 2B and 2C. You can find the handouts and other lesson resources under student downloads beneath the lesson videos on the Knowledge on the Go page on the Great Minds website. Again, pause the video and make sure you are prepared for today's lesson. As you may recall, the essential question, a question for this module, is how can sports influence individuals and societies. And the question for over a few lessons, our focusing question, is how can sports affect the way we view others? We will continue with our content framing question. What does a deeper exploration of the narrator reveal in Raymond's run? Remember, the narrator tells events from their point of view. In the previous lesson, you had focused on the narrator's description in Raymond's run to discover her view of the world, herself, and other characters. In this lesson, we'll continue the story Raymond's run and analyze Squeaky's interaction with the other characters. You'll have a chance to explore how sports can affect the way we view others. We're going to start with examining the setting of the story. Let me show you a quick picture. This is a picture of the next scene that takes place on a street called Broadway in Harlem. This photograph of Harlem shows us a center area a center island in the middle of which Squeaky refers to in the next scene of our story. Today we'll be reading paragraphs 4 to 13, or if you don't have the handout, you'll listen and follow along to the read aloud. Reminder, if you have the handout, follow along or you can read on your own paragraphs 4 to 13. I'm standing on the corner admiring the weather and about to take a stroll down Broadway so I can practice my breathing exercises. And I've got Raymond walking on the inside close to the buildings because he's subject to fits of fantasy and starts thinking he's a circus performer and that the curb is a tight rope strung high in the air. And sometimes, after a rain, he likes to step down off his tightrope, right into the gutter, and slosh around, getting his shoes and cuffs wet. Then I get hit when I get home. Or sometimes, if you don't watch him, he'll dash across traffic to the island in the middle of Broadway and give the pigeons a fit. Then I have to go behind him, apologizing to all the old people sitting around trying to get some sun, 
and getting all upset with the pigeons fluttering around them, scattering their newspapers and upsetting the wax paper lunches in their laps. So I keep Raymond on the inside of me, and he plays like he's driving the stagecoach, which is okay by me, so long as he doesn't run me over or interrupt my breathing exercise, which I have to do on account of I'm serious about my running, and I don't care who knows it. Now, some people like to act like things come easy to them. Won't let on that they practice. Not me. I'll high prance down 34th Street like a rodeo pony to keep my knees strong, even if it does get my mother uptight so that she walks ahead like she's not with me. Don't know me. Is all by myself on a shopping trip and I am somebody else's crazy child. Now you take Cynthia Proctor, for instance. She's just the opposite. If there's a test tomorrow, she'll say something like, Oh, I guess I'll play handball this afternoon and watch television tonight. Just to let you know she ain't thinking about the test. Or like last week when she won the spelling bee for the millionth time. A good thing you got received, squeaky. Because I would have got it wrong. I completely forgot about the spelling bee. And she'll clutch the lace on her blouse like it was a narrow escape. Oh, brother. But of course, when I pass her house on my early morning trots around the block, she is practicing the scales on the piano over and over and over and over. Then in music class, she always lets herself get bumped around so she falls accidentally on purpose onto the piano stool and is so surprised to find herself sitting there that she decides just for fun to try out the old keys. And what do you know? Choppin's waltz just sprang out of her fingertips and she's the most surprised thing in the world. A regular prodigy. I could kill people like that. I stay up all night studying the words for the spelling bee, and you can see me any time of day practicing running. I never walk if I can trot, and shame on Raymond if he can't keep up. But of course he does, because if he hangs back, someone's liable to walk up to him and get smart, or take his allowance from him, or ask him where he got the great big pumpkin head. People are so stupid sometimes. So I'm strolling down Broadway, breathing out and breathing in on counts of seven, which is my lucky number, and here comes Gretchen and her sidekicks, Mary Louise, who used to be a friend of mine when she first moved to Harlem from Baltimore and got beat up ev by everybody till I took up for her on account of her mother and my mother used to sing in the same choir when they were young girls. But people ain't grateful. So now she hangs out with the new girl, Gretchen, and talks about me like a dog. And Rosie, who is as fat as I am skinny and has a big mouth where Raymond is concerned and is too stupid to know that there is not a big deal of difference between herself and Raymond and that she can't afford to throw stones. So they all steady coming up Broadway and I see straight away that it's going to be one of those Dodge City scenes because the street ain't that big and they're close to the building just as we are. First I think I'll step into the candy store and look over the new comments and let them pass. But that's chicken and I've got a reputation to consider. So then I think I'll just walk straight on through them or even over them if necessary. But as they get to me they slow down. I'm ready to fight because, I, like I said, I don't feature a whole lot of chit-chat. I much prefer to just knock you down right from the jump and save everybody a lot of precious time. You sign up for the May Day races, smiles Mary Louise, only it's not a smile at all. A dumb question like that doesn't deserve an answer. Besides, they're just me and Gretchen standing there, really. So no use wasting my breath talking to shadows. I don't think 
You're going to win this time, says Rosie, trying to signify with her hands on her hips, all salty, completely forgetting that I have whooped her behind many times for less than salt. For less salt than that. I always win, because I'm the best, I say straight at Gretchen, who is, as far as I'm concerned, the only one talking in this ventriloquist dummy routine. Gretchen smiles, but it's not a smile, and I'm thinking that girls never really smile at each other because they don't know how and don't want to know how, and there's probably no one to teach us how because grown-up girls don't know either. Then they all look at Raymond, who has just brought this mule team to a standstill, and they're about to see what trouble they can get into through him. What grade you in now, Raymond? You got anything to say to my brother? You say it to me, Mary Louise Williams of Raggedy Town, Baltimore. What are you, his mother? Sasses Rosie. That's right, Fatso, and the next word out of anybody, and I'll be their mother too. So they just stand there, and Gretchen shifts from one leg to the other, and so do they. Then Gretchen puts her hands out on her hips and is about to say something with her freckle-faced self, but doesn't. Then she walks around me, looking me up and down, but keeps walking up Broadway, and her sidekicks follow her. So me and Raymond smile at each other, and he says, Giddy up! to his team, and I continue with my breathing exercises, strolling down Broadway toward the Iceman on 145th with not a care in the world, because I am Miss Quicksilver. Now let's add to our story map in our journal. We're going to summarize the setting, characters, and events in this scene. Find your story map in your journal, and let's add another section titled Scene 1. In Scene 1, we're going to add the characters. Who are the main characters in this scene, including the new ones you meet? Setting. Where does this story take place at? Events. Describe the events that have happened in this scene. Remember to pause the video now and fill in these pieces. Now pause the video and look at the sample responses. Remember, yours may not be exactly the same and that is okay. What more have you learned so far about Squeaky's traits or personality? How would you describe Squeaky? Stop for a minute and think. Here are some sample responses. She stands up to anyone who makes fun of Raymond. This shows that she is both tough and caring. She is confident in her abilities and determined to win the race. Now let's analyze the piece that we have read from Raymond's Run. Let's reread paragraph 6 so that we can infer about Squeaky's feelings as Gretchen and her sidekicks approach. What makes you think? So, so again, based on the language in paragraph 6, what can you infer about Squeaky's feelings as Gretchen and her sidekicks approach? Let's reread paragraph 6. So I'm strolling down Broadway, breathing out and breathing in on counts of seven, which is my lucky number. And here comes Gretchen and her sidekicks, Mary Louise, who used to be a friend of mine when she first moved to Harlem from Baltimore and got beat up by everybody till I took up for her on account of her mother and my mother used to sing in the same choir 
when they were young girls. But people ain't grateful, so now she hangs out with the new girl, Gretchen, and talks about me like a dog. And Rosie, who is fat as I am skinny and has a big mouth where Raymond is concerned, and is too stupid to know that there is not a big deal of difference between herself and Raymond, and that she can't afford to throw stones. So they are steady coming up Broadway, and I see right away that it's going to be one of those Dodge City scenes, because the street ain't that big, and they're close to the buildings, just like we are. First, I think I'll step into the candy store and look over the new comics and let them pass. But that's chicken, and I've got a reputation to consider. So then I think I'll just walk straight on through them, or even over them if necessary. But as they get to me, they slow down. I'm ready to fight, because like I said, I don't feature a whole lot of chit-chat. I much prefer to just knock you down right from the jump and save everybody a lot of precious time. Based on the language in paragraph 6 that we just read, what can you infer about Squeaky's feelings as Gretchen and her sidekicks approach? What makes you think so? Remember to pause the video and answer your question. Some of the possible answers that you may have for this is that Squeaky says that her first instinct is to step into the candy store and let them pass. This shows that she feels nervous about facing these girls. Or you could possibly say Squeaky is determined to show that she is tough and not willing to back down. She says that letting the girls pass would be chicken and that she has a reputation to consider. Next question. In paragraph 7, Squeaky says, Besides, there's just me and Gretchen standing there, really. So no use wasting my breath talking to shadows. Why does Squeaky refer to Mary Louise and Rosie as shadows? What does this reveal about how Squeaky views this interaction? Remember to pause the video to jot down your answer in your journal. One of your possible answers, to Squeaky, it is as if the other girls are invisible. Gretchen's the only person that matters to Squeaky in this conversation. Even though the other girls are present, Squeaky sees this interaction as a confrontation between her and Gretchen, her rival. Now, how does Squeaky interpret Gretchen's smile in paragraph 9? Let's go and reread paragraph 9. Think about why do you think she feels this way. Paragraph 9. I always win because I'm the best, I say straight at Gretchen, who is, as far as I'm concerned, the only one talking in this ventriloquist dummy routine. Gretchen smiles, but it's not a smile. And I'm thinking that girls never really smile at each other because they don't know how and don't want to know how. And there's probably no one to teach us how because grown-up girls don't know either. Then they all look at Raymond, who has just brought his mule team to a stand. And they're about to see what trouble they can get into through him. Go ahead and stop the video and jot down your response to the question. Squeaky doesn't think that Gretchen's smile is real. Squeaky doesn't really know Gretchen or try to know her. She just sees Gretchen as a rival.
I want you to think about what you've learned about Squeaky by examining her interactions with the other characters. In your journals, you may write, answer the question, what are Squeaky's most important character traits? Write two to four sentences describing two of Squeaky's most important traits and provide one piece of evidence from the story to support each trait. If you have handout 2B, look back at paragraphs 4 to 13 or pause the video and go back and listen to the story again. As additional support, there is the option of completing fluency practice on handout 2C. Remember, you can access handouts under student downloads beneath the lesson videos. In the next lesson, we will read the rest of Raymond's run and analyze Squeaky's initial perspective towards Raymond and Gretchen. As always, feel free to contact us at info at greatminds.org if you have any questions or need support. Every child is capable of greatness. Thank you for learning together today. Take care and see you next time.